Um, I want to come back to you as well later on on this question of whether or not selling tourism as a kind of social cause is enough to overcome any of the problems that we might be facing around environmental issues. The floor's open. Our normal rules apply. Please stand up, say who you are. And I'd prefer it if you said something interesting rather than asked a question. And we'll give ourselves 45 minutes or so or longer if we need it, I think, uh, for a good going over the proposition, the methods, the results, the policy implications. Who'd like to go first, please? Microphones will circulate. And could you please speak relatively close to them because otherwise we lose it? Hello. Thank you. Um, fascinating talk. Thank you. Uh, Jane Forbes, Senior Lecturer, University of the Arts. Um, a number of things, really. I'm just wondering if you'd had come to any kinds of conclusions, if there is anything that you could see that um, seems to be the same for the countries or the destinations that seem to have a more positive result than the more negative. And I'm just wondering, having just read the spirit level, uh, Kate Pickett, Richard Wilkinson, about inequalities, if inequalities in societies might have anything to do with that. Openness, maybe, political systems. Uh, if there is anything at all that you could identify that might make a difference there. Um, also, just wondering if you've done anything on Kerala, because that would follow along, because it just seems there's a more equal society. That, that there might be something there that would be interesting. Oh, uh, finally, just a comment about <laughs> environmental damage and looking at that vis-a-vis -vis socioeconomic costs. Because the biggest problem is the actual flight itself. And that's a really difficult one to square. I know for myself, being an environmentalist, that I have a real problem. But I believe that uh, going abroad and spending my money locally is <laughs> more important than the issue of the flight. But actually, mm. is it? <laughs> mm. Thank you. Let, let's hold the environmental thing for a minute and, and look at this question first of, of who gains and who loses and why. Can we just have that, that, uh, that one? Just first of all, can I just understand, is that all your channels put together, or is that the direct spend? Uh, that, that's all the channels put together. So it's, it's a real mixture of the, both the direct and the indirect. Um, anybody else want to ask about this before we come back to this particular question? Yes, mm. over there. Sorry, uh, John Froome, just an amateur, really. Um, but uh, uh, just on this, does this include state spending as well? Does it include a, a sort no, it of making doesn't. it? So you're not making any judgment about what the state does with the taxes it gets from tourism? The, um, the only place that it includes tax is on the Kilimanjaro because there are huge park fees and uh, the safari tourism because that that often makes up more than half of the cost of the total package. And a fascinating story in there. I mean, the, the official position is really quite a significant part of that state expenditure is earmarked for poor local communities. And it's not getting there. All right. Same applies in Rwanda, actually. It is included in Rwanda what is used from the park fees what element flows to communities. So we're not looking at general tax revenue and how that affects the pool, which comes under dynamic impacts and is very important. But this is just looking at the flow of dollars to the pool, which includes their share of park fees, but not spending of tax revenue on schools, for example. Uh, what about this specific, specific set of questions about how you explain the difference in that chart? Who's going to go first on that, Caroline? Yeah, I don't think there is a single factor. Um, but the ones that have high linkages have more, they have more linkages, but they're different types of linkages in different places. If we take northern Tanzania, it's very much about pay and the fact it's a labor intensive product. John can come back on this, he did Tanzania. It's the labor intensity of the porters. Whereas if you take Luang Prabang, uh, it was the shopping expenditure, very high shopping relative to the total cost of a holiday. So the linkages were strong because of the way the product has developed and the economy has developed, but they were different kinds of strengths in different places. John, do you want to add more on that? Yeah, just, just one point, really. And I think you, you hit the nail on the head that, obviously, if you look at different types of tourism, there's a whole range of reasons why it works in some places and, and not in others, to do with the, the type of tourism, uh, something to do with the tourism product, and... I think the more, more important point, though, is the one that you raised about what sort of countries manage to squeeze more of the benefits from tourism uh, into the local economy. 
And uh, you mentioned, I think, openness in the society. And there's um, it's been some brilliant work which has looked at exactly this. And it finds that places that are open, democratic, <coughs> uh, position of women is critical point um, on International Women's Day, but also on other days. And also the level of education and the freedom uh, for people to uh, create and sustain small business um, and low crime. There's a very strong link between those factors and whether tourism has strong linkages or weak linkages. I've got a question from Clive Allen at Bournemouth University, uh, which reads, how critical do you see the tackling of corruption is in allowing tourism to help lead poverty reduction? Very. Very, that's a quick answer. <laughs> it, it comes back to, when you, when you introduced it at the beginning, Simon, you talked about best practice. And I'm slightly uncomfortable with that term <coughs> because there's a lot of things that are more structural. It depends on the state of play of the economy and not necessarily just what a business does or a tourist. But in terms of the structure of the economy, that depends on corruption, bribery, who's incentive, what, who's, who's interest the planners are making decisions in, in favour of. And that's where it's absolutely key. What's driving the development of that destination? If there's a market where people can sell stuff, who's allowed to sell there? Who's allowed the land? What, how the terms and the concessions are in When I worked in Namibia, we used to argue about the, whether it was an and or an or and a comma in a sentence, in a concession agreement, because that affected the legal right the community had. And it's those things behind the scenes that really matter. Any other thoughts on the economics before we move on to the environmental issues? Two more over here. Thank you very much. My name is Joa Soon, and I'm the Director for Tourism Policy and Planning, Ministry of Tourism in Ghana. And I've just uh, submitted my thesis on the role of tourism in poverty reduction in Ghana. Yeah, the issue I want to uh, I want to address is uh, when you're looking at all these areas, especially Ghana, did you consider areas which the government had identified as the poverty-stricken areas, especially looking at the tourism spending? Mm -hmm. Because from the government point of view, and from where I'm coming from, government might be interested in looking at how will they use tourism to address poverty in the communities especially which have been identified within the poverty reduction strategy as poverty stricken areas. For example, if you take Accra, which is a business area, most tourists don't stay in Accra, but they will prefer to go to areas like Elmina. So my issue is, in terms of developing countries, how do we use tourism to address uh, poverty you know, issues in the communities which have been identified as poverty stricken communities? You know, the test of a PhD student, this is very unfair. Mm -hmm. I'm going to ask you, just tell us in two sentences what you concluded at the end of your PhD. Yes, one, tourists really go to communities outside the main areas, especially the urban areas. Secondly, government in terms of developing countries do not take tourism as a committed, they don't give commitment to tourism. So if we want to uh, really get government to be committed in tourism, we need to really direct their focus to communities where which have been identified as poverty-stricken areas. That's what I'm trying to ask. I mean, uh, that is a quite a challenging proposition if there's nothing for tourists to do in places where poor people happen to be. Well, if I may, I may, I may say so, you, you may be perfectly right, but in developing countries, ministries of uh, finance and economic planning do not take tourism seriously. For example, in Ghana, cocoa, gold, and now oil. And in more developing countries, Tourism needs to be put on the agenda, and the poverty reduction agenda. And if we want to get the government to be committed to that, then we need to get the ministries of uh, finance and economic planning to be interested in tourism. And this is where I'm trying to draw the issue. I guess the risk for Ghana is you turn into Gambia, which is, which is close. The risk for Ghana is you become a kind of Gambia type of destination, which is towards the bottom end of the scale. Uh, another one over there on economics, and we'll come back to you. My name is Roger Bone of a uh, consultancy called Bonewell's Urbicon. Um, I'm an economist, but I'm not sure my questions are uh, entirely economic, perhaps a bit more general. But I quite like uh, uh, our ODI speakers to uh, perhaps say a few words about how they distinguish poor people in the, these destination countries. I mean, obviously, in many countries, it's the great majority, but you know, for a practitioner, it's, it's uh, 
a quite an important uh, issue. Um, second, um, just prompted by the lady who mentioned Carola just now, um, it's quite interesting and brings up, I think, what uh, John was talking about. Uh, my daughter just visited Carola, took her family there, and uh, as, as they, people do these days, uh, I was there when she was doing it, she was arranging the whole thing on the internet pretty well. And this obviously is an increasing way people you know, do, 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 do their, their tourism planning. And of course, at the, at the destination end, um, if, if the poorer sectors don't have that sort of access, you know, they're going to be, find it more and more difficult to, to get through to them. So I'd be quite interested to see if there are any reflections on that sort of movement. Thank you. Yes, last one over here. Uh, Trisha Barnett, Tourism Concern. As a response to the, 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 your statement about Ghana, can I just say that um, I've seen the Ghana Trade Minister and the Ghana Trade Department uh, argue for pro poor tourism to Ghana in UNCTAD, supported by foreign direct investment. I've seen them argue very strongly for... Um, tourism to Ghana being a really important pro poor feature of their economy. And so I wonder, um, in all this, where foreign direct investment sits, where part of the package normally means that taxes aren't actually paid by foreign investors. And in relation to Kerala, I would just say that um, a tourism concern, we've got a great exhibition on at the moment, a little plug here. Um, down at the Guardian Gallery at King's Place, and it's about Kerala and Tamil Nadu, and it's about how the poor are impoverished by tourism. No, just wait a minute. Don't wait a minute. Hang on to that <laughs> microphone. <laughs> Why and how? Why? Because um, tourism is a very land-hungry business, and one of the key factors in relation to poverty and tourism is who owns the land. And what happens when land grabbers, as they call them in Kerala, they call them actually the mafia, come to take the land. And those people who've been earning a living by fishing lose their land or sell it too cheaply because they're so pressurized that actually the living they make in tourism is less than the living they made by fishing. Or they move inland and have no living to make at all. And the conclusion is? The conclusion is that one has to look at the, the micro picture in full to understand better how people benefit those who are poor from tourism. I mean, the conclusion might be uh, there were all these benefits will generate new jobs, perhaps in new places, and that this is an inevitable disruption. You know, creative destruction, as Schumpeter called it, is an essential part of development. I mean, that could be a counter argument. That is usually the counter argument. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Uh, are you on this topic? Yes. Yes, I am. Um, Claudine you Nagaya. You say who you are. Claudine Nagaya from Andaman Discoveries in Thailand. Um, <laughs> Just on a counter-argument to the counter-argument, really. Um, we work with um, a number of small fishing communities who are using community tourism um, to basically um, stop uh, land grabbers coming in and taking over um, their land. And it, it actually provides them with an income. But also, more importantly, um, it allows them pres to preserve their l traditional lifestyles and their cultural heritage. We're working with Mokan communities, who are sea gypsies, and um, also with Muslim communities, who are very um, underprivileged in Thai society. So although a lot of the focus here is on poverty, there are also other aspects, such as cultural um, integrity, that um, it would be interesting to know whether your research had looked at at all. Very good. What's a sea gypsy? A sea gypsy is um, a nomadic tribe that live on um, fishing boats, basically. And um, they've been forced inland more and more in, in recent times. And so they're losing their cultural heritage and their traditional way of life. 
very good. There's a set of issues there around whether we're just pulling the wool over people's eyes with this book. So why don't we start with that? Caroline or Jonathan? Caroline. I'm very happy to, yeah. Um, uh, no, we're not. What, what, what we've done, and I think it's really important that we're clear on this, we haven't looked at cultural factors because an immense number of people have. And what we were trying to do was to plug a gap as, as we saw it. Um, one of the, the first studies of this kind that I did was in the Gambia. And so I Googled tourism in the Gambia, and I got pages and pages of references about uh, beach boys and sex tourism, and looked through the whole thing, and at no point had anyone asked questions who's actually benefiting from this. And so uh, that's not to say it's not important. It's just that we were trying to fill a gap which you know, which hadn't, hadn't been addressed. Jonathan, hang on. Sorry, forgive me for interrupting you. I mean, mm. this is not quite cultural factors. I mean, the point that Trish has made is you're showing benefits to the poor from <coughs> tourism. Yeah. But there are also very big losers, and they're yeah. not just losing their culture. They're presumably also losing economically. Yeah. yeah. And, and yeah. are you saying that we haven't yet, in your work, factored that possibility into the calculations? Yeah, I think the... Um, the difficulty where, where you visit a, a destination and you're um, trying to estimate the impact is that it's very difficult to know who owned the land before the current user owned the land. I, I think that there's, I think Trish has got a very strong point on the, in terms of the land market and in terms of some people losing their land at a below market price. I think it's absolutely true. Um, there are, of course, cases where that hasn't happened, and actually one of the major gains of tourism has been, for instance, large areas of Turkey where farmers have sold land and, and uh, made very large capital gains from it. So uh, the land market, I agree, is extremely important, and it does cut both ways. Generally, the land market operates not to the advantage of the weak and the vulnerable, which goes back to the, the question of corruption, because that's where the state has a role in uh, administering land to avoid people being thrown off land or dispossessed from it. And that's why corruption is such an important issue, I think. Caroline? It's a really interesting question. Given we both started off working on community tourism, rural tourism, focusing on livelihoods, have we disinherited our heritage? Which, to an extent, we have. You will find some stuff in here that is as scathingly rude about community tourism as we could bring ourselves to be as people who started off in it. Because a lot of it doesn't work, a lot of it is unprofitable, and an awful lot of donor and NGO subsidy goes into it and so on. So to an extent, we have said, you know, let's, let's smell the coffee, let's not go where poverty-stricken areas are, let's focus on where the tourists go and get the linkages going around there and get the poor there, and we've taken a very kind of hard line, follow the dollar approach to an extent. But not wanting to sound like a complete arch conservative here, um, I think things are coming full circle. I think where we've got to is realizing that, well, if what matters is that communities are in control, as long as the enterprise is viable, well, you know, it's not going to be the best seller, but that's one issue. If what you're trying to do is maximize the follow the dollar and not worry about health impacts, environmental impacts, everything else, here's another set of agendas. And of course, it's more nuanced. So we're trying to fill the <coughs> information gap so people can do both of those. And of course, tourism concern focuses on the one, and we have not focused on that. But I, I think we're not seeing it as a, a black and white choice. We're trying to make sure there is the information there on the financial side that can be taken into account as well. But Simon's completely right. The data on the costs is not there in a way that can readily be incorporated into this. It's anecdotes, it's campaigns, it's stories, it's very personal stories. It's like with all these silos of research, no one's really making the links between them. We probably haven't made those links. And you're not going to jump on the Schumpeter, uh, you know, the Schumpeter <laughs> option, which is to say, well, there are long-term benefits to wider communities which outweigh the costs. Well, yes, there are. But in the, the, the discussion of dynamic effects, says very clearly we have these negative ones of disrupting <coughs> livelihoods, 
collapse of a fishing industry or something, we also have these positive ones. This uh, Ledger Agua and Valkenhorst World Bank one about diversification, where it develops all new industries, jewellery industries and transport industries, and because of the linkages that are created in the microcosm of the destination and go on the economy, there are both. It, it's not one or the other. Can I say one other thing on Trisha's point? Most of that is very grey, or we know there's black and white. The one thing I am really clear on is whether it's foreign or not, I do not think is the key factor. Uh, John's been looking at this in some recent work, and I looked in Tunisia when I was living there, comparing foreign managed tourism to domestically owned tourism. And you had really good and practice at both extremes that was, was both domestic and foreign. Most hotels and resorts don't make enough money to really generate that much tax, so it doesn't really matter where the tax goes. <coughs> Tour operators are making their money on insurance and other things anyway. And the, what matters is the practice on the ground. So whether it's foreign or domestic, it can be corrupt or it could be good. All right. I'm not going to allow us to be distracted by this question of who is poor, but there is, oh, yeah. there is a, there is a yeah. box in, in the book which will answer that question for you. Um, I want to spend some time on environment, and I want to spend some time on the business end. And I've got a couple of questions here about government policy as well. So we've got at least three things still to cover. Let's not exactly guillotine, but just hold the economics <coughs> discussion. Um, but I'm now worried about Schumpeter, and I do think we need to come back to the creative bit and the destructive bit and deal with this argument in more detail. Um, climate change and other environmental costs, um, and in particular the carbon cost of, uh, of, of tourism growth. Mm. Do we have a kind of one-liner on that? <laughs> <laughs> No, we don't. We're, well, I guess our one-liner is that um, we can see that the analysis that we've done here has to be balanced with some appreciation of the environmental costs, and that's why we're we're going to look at it. I think that uh, I think that within it, its its parameters, it's entirely legitimate what's been done here. I think that. Given the um, uh, the interest in climate change, but also the likelihood that legislation is going to force change in the, in that area in terms of increasing the the costs of aviation, uh, I think it's entirely the right time to do that. And I think it's as true for tourism as it is French beans from Kenya, uh, any any uh, air freighted horticulture. We're all looking at it because it's, it's become the centre of, of the debate now. There's an interesting discussion in the book about tourism compared to other forms of development. And I suppose mm. the question is not, is this more carbon emissions than nothing at all? Is it, but the question is, is it more carbon emissions than the other thing you might yeah. be doing if you weren't doing tourism, yeah. Yeah. including fishing development, I guess. Um, but it is a really serious issue, this question mm. of whether or not a growing tourism industry will be sustainable in the face of, of carbon constraints. Can anybody help us or ask another question on this? Do we have an answer? Simon, while people yes, are thinking please. on that, um, I do think, and this might be making a merit out of something that's clearly a problem, but I do think that raises a huge opportunity to get this agenda higher up, higher up the industry's thinking, because the industry is going to have to think more and more about its license to trade to use that sort of public affairs term. You know, what is the global purpose of, of tourism? And if, if, the, um, educa if the industry can be helped to think and articulate its business case much more in terms of its global social and economic purpose, and not just the benefits to the traveler, then I think you can naturally see uh, a, common, uh, a common vocabulary that can be developed there to help the industry think more about doing a better job at helping pro poor tourism. And I think that that is a mechanism to change thinking. It doesn't address the environmental issue or anything else, but as a, met uh, a methodology for changing the way we engage with industry, I think there's lots of opportunity there. Please. Um, yes, also, just in terms of flights are going to be that much. The flights uh, will be mo that much more expensive, and therefore the tourism product itself, the pro-poor tourism product, could be seen as a much higher value product, and therefore it could be that more money would actually get into the local community because people would be prepared to spend more because they are they're expecting it to be a more expensive product, and so it actually might help them in the long run. So it could be there might not be you know, lots more people actually doing this, but the people who are doing it might be spending more and prepared to spend more. I must say, if I was running a tourism industry, I'd be doing 
three things. One is I'd be focusing like mad on reducing the carbon load of the hotels and the other destination activities, on which there's a lot happening, I think. Mm. Um, secondly, I would be encouraging people to stay for longer so that I'd get a higher number of bed nights with fewer flights. And thirdly, I would be investing huge amounts in offsetting options. I mean, really good, solid, reliable, gold standard offsetting for flights as a way of providing the justification. And, and are those sensible ideas? And is there anything else we should be doing? Any of you? Well, um, I'll take the first one. Um, there, there is quite a lot of work that's being done um, to reduce the carbon load of hotels. Um, but it doesn't get us off the hook because that's, uh, it's too high. It's being brought down through a whole range of uh, mainly uh, self-governance uh, regulations. Um, but even if it was dramatically reduced, it wouldn't uh, get you away from the point that somewhere between three quarters and, uh, and higher of the carbon imprint of a holiday is the flight. And on flights, a lot of work is being done because obviously people that run airlines don't want to waste fuel uh, as much as uh, environmentalists don't want to create carbon. Um, but the, and there's being incremental improvement there. But you can't get away from the fact that if your business model is moving people around the world, that you're going to create carbon. Particularly if your business model is moving people around the world at very low margins, which is, of course, a feature of the mainstream industry. When they introduced the uh, one pound levy, was it originally? Right at the beginning for the Travel Foundation. Uh, the mainstream companies, the big package store operators, asked for one pound contribution. At first, there were an awful lot of opt outs. That was only a pound. And now? Um, I don't know what the rates are now. They've gone up so quite well. About a 40% opt-out now. Went from uh, below 10 to about 60% uh, take up. If, so if of an operator that's actually engaged in trying to do it well, you can get it up to 60%. But you know, when you think about a pound from a holiday cost, it's it's nothing. So mm. it's also something about uh, well, it's also something about our society, I suspect. As much then as anything. The other else. thing is that we're talking all the time as if tourism was about flying from here to the Maldives and some it is about going from here to Bournemouth, kind of thing. Yeah. And some, so domestic tourism Ooh, in many developing countries. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. And, and your figure of, of 275, whatever it was, billion pounds, is international expenditure or does that include domestic tourism? No, that's international. And do we have any, uh, any sense of what domest the domestic spend would be? Um, well, my, my, I don't have a number, but it's absolutely <coughs> massive. Domestic tourism, um, we, we found right across Africa, and Asia, it's always massive, and it's almost completely under the radar. It's because you, you, it's very hard to count domestic tourists. They don't necessarily arrive at an airport. They don't need a visa. It's very hard to count them. I mean, we get, get enough problems actually counting international tourists in most developing countries. So it's completely under the radar. And normally you find, or we found, I think almost everywhere we've looked, absolutely huge numbers of people are involved and each each person often spending not very much money but when you aggregate it um, particularly in places like Vietnam um, uh, a lot of a lot of Southeast Asia it's often actually bigger on aggregate than international tourism okay very good let's let's move on to the business case issues um, uh, Jonathan, you said we've got very good or we've got much sharper at making the case to business of why they should yeah. do this. Yeah. And uh, John gave us kind of part of an answer around your kind of license to operate issue. <coughs> mm. what, what, what's your case? Well, th there certainly is. There, there is part of the license to operate. I mean, in, in Southern Africa, it was not very subtle because if, as a, as a tourist operator, particularly in rural areas, if you didn't treat... Uh, the local community very well. They threw bricks at tourists. It was very straightforward. So it wasn't a, a philosophical point. It was about actually the safety of uh, tourists and ultimately the sustainability of your operation. Um, but uh, the business case varies, actually. Um, saving money is often part of it. Um, for instance, uh, we looked at a, a project in Brazil where... Uh, there's a very successful attempt to localise um, the staff. 
and this was in one of the poorest parts of Brazil, and staff were uh, bussed in from a local, uh, well, not very local city, uh, costing a huge amount of money for the employer and uh, bypassing local community in terms of uh, the benefits. The local community then had a, a quiet word with the, uh, the resort owner, and uh, that's the Bank of Brazil, and uh, said, unless this changes very rapidly, we're going to burn the resort down. So it's kind of Latin American political activism. But the, the result of that was that very quickly a 1,800-bed resort went from employing 10% of the local population, uh, had 10% of its workforce were from the local area. It increased up to 60%. It's $2 million every year, straight increase, straight into local community. And the, the real gem was that it actually was in the business interests of the resort owners because they didn't have to pay to bus people in from, from the local city. So there are a surprising number of cases where the business case is actually very, very straightforward. You can increase local links and you can reduce costs. In addition to that and, and the social license to operate, um, very often you can look at the quality of the, uh, of the service that's provided, looking at repeater rates. And increasingly, I think, as, as uh, parts of the industry become much more responsible, um, look at reputational damage from doing bad things in, in local, local economies. And the reputational damage uh, is, for a lot of the industry, precisely because it's so concentrated, is dramatic. What about reputational benefits, that this is a market niche that people <coughs> want to fill? Is that uh, an issue? I think it is an issue, although I spend my life arguing to get away from niche, that yeah. uh, you know sustainability in all its senses should be about doing tourism better. <coughs> and I think if, if that ex experiential part that you're really touching on there, mm. be better uh, experience for the consumer, different sort of engagement, real engagement in the, like, in the destination is part of the formula, and then that's nothing to do with the product type or a niche, that's about tourism, learning to do it better, and that may be highly aspirational, but that leads to a truly sustainable effect, and it leads logically to a much more leveraged effect just by sheer scale of it. So I would, I would argue for, always argue, but that's my thing, away from the, the kind of niche approach, because um, I think it just provides, it, it provides an excuse and it provides very unpredictable results, frankly. Um, I've got a couple of comments to come in, but I've got a question from Anonymous of Colombia who says, do you have any insights, reflections, information on the incentives that would deepen the tourist market development, which is not quite public policy, but we'll come to that in a second. But I mm. hear you saying, well, there are negative incentives because you might get bricks thrown at you. Mm. There are some positive incentives because you might find um, some cost savings mm. uh, and that, um, that there's a kind of virtuous circle of reputation uh, which you can gain, both positive and negative, um, and that um, this may be, for some operators in some spaces, a marketing opportunity as well. Mm. You wanted to come in on this question. Um, <coughs> yes. Uh, Could you stand up, please? Uh, Roger Disky. I'm uh, I responsible for sustainable tourism at uh, ATO, the Association of uh, Independent Tour Operators. That's about 150 smaller tour operators, um, many of whom focus in the uh, poorer countries. And um, we spend a lot of time on this issue. And one thing which uh, I think tour operators feel strongly, large and small, is that looking at our customers in five or ten years' time, they're going to be far more aware of these issues than consumers are today. I mean, today maybe it's an issue for around about 25% of consumers, but uh, the young are running with sustainability issues and they're going to be our clients in the future. So um, everyone is looking at what they can do. And also one thing that's, that's blindingly clear is that where you have a, 
uh, a happy, well-looked-after staff and community, you will get happy customers coming back and spreading the word, and it's good for business. So it's very hard to make a case these days for um, not uh, doing right by the communities in destinations, um, except in the most kind of unreconstructed package holidays and in some of the all-inclusives or very low-priced holidays where I think the, the, the big tour operators have a job to do. Um, one thing that's very interesting that happened in the last month, uh, well, since February, one of our members became the subject of a campaign um, because they were or had been developing a lodge in an area which was environmentally sensitive. And very quickly, with the internet and with a web-based campaign which people were signing from everywhere from Japan to Java, you know, uh, saying this is an outrage, they very quickly had to back off and, uh, and rethink what they were doing. Where something which, you know, in the past nobody would have even noticed it, it became a worldwide issue in a matter of weeks. And I think um, reputational damage is really a very important and a very useful tool, I think, for people who are interested in ensuring that people clean up their act in the tourism sector. When you discuss this, just your... Which, are you looking at all the channels here, in, 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 or are you mainly looking at the direct wage effects and so on? Are you looking at the supply chains, where these resorts buy their food from? Uh? Um, the, the, the effects are much greater than in the resort. And I mean, one of the things that is uh, going fast up the agenda is water usage, uh, where I was in um, Zanzibar, there are all these lovely new uh, beachside resorts and lorries are going inland to collect water from uh, village wells. And, you know, soon there's going to be a problem there yeah. affecting the whole island community. It's, um, tourism has a much greater effect. And, uh, yes, I think we have to look at all the effects. Um, I have just an, uh, one coda to all of this. As a member of the board of the Fair Trade Foundation, why don't we have fair trade tourism? Mm. Uh, <laughs> we do. <laughs> I'm so Please sorry. <laughs> well, do we have? We don't have quote fair trade tourism. Do we have Thanks. fair trade so tourism? Like fair trade tourism South Africa. Yeah. 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 You're on the way. You're on the way. Just tell on us what's way. happening then. Well, not in detail, but. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but there is a conversation going on about fair trade tourism. Yeah. For, about 10 years. <laughs> For a very long time, we've done loads and loads of work at Tourism Concern on what it would look like and what it should be. And now we're trying to put it into practice. It's not easy. It's taking its ages. But the Fair Trade Foundation are working very closely with us, and we're in partnership with them to hopefully trial something. Yeah. And tell us about Fair Trade Foundation South Africa, Fair Trade South Africa. Fairtrade Tourism South Africa. Oliver Bennett, Fairtrade Tourism South Africa is, uh, well, it's been going for, it was one of the projects we sponsored on with DFID money under the Tourism Challenge Fund. Mm. Of memory, it's been running since about 90, uh, yeah, 1994 or something like that. And I will be meeting with them in Berlin later this week, but I believe they're doing very well. Very good. Thank you very much. Okay, quick response, and then Sorry, we're going to come. Just one point yes, on, the, on yes. the corporate aspects. It seems to me we are, there are two as ways of looking at it. One is the purely commercial angle and the other is corporate social responsibility. And I think there's a lot of mileage in corporate social responsibility. I think the danger is just thinking in a tourism box and thinking about the, the previous chart and the Gambia. One of the best projects we funded under the Tourism Challenge Fund and the successor was the Gambia is Good project, which is a private sector-led project and now benefits 10,000 people in the Gambia who are growing horticultural prop crops for the tourism industry. About 70% of them are ladies. <coughs> and how did it come about? Well, it came about through the philanthropic activities of a British commercial company, not a company in tourism, a company in horticulture. Who has it benefited? A lot of ladies. Is it about tourism precisely? Okay, very good. 
quick responses on this question of making the business case, if you want to, and then we'll move on to the mm. final section, mm. which is going to be about public policy. Okay, three, three points I just wanted to add to the discussion. We talked about whether it should be as a niche or not, and you know we all recognise that you can make your brand a niche and benefit from being good, but we don't want it to be niche. I think we also need to recognise you can get benefits from being a leader. You might be a very mainstream company, a leading mainstream company, but by, by being a market leader in sustainability or responsibility or pro poorness, you get real benefits. And once you are the leader, of course, you want to maintain your leadership position. Uh, the, the week after the world economic crisis sent us all into deepest gloom, I was in a tourism industry meeting, and it was the market leaders in the room were saying, yeah, our, our board need us to stay leaders in this. And the others were saying, it's just even further on the back burner now. So there's a, a leadership thing, however big you are. Um, tourism is different. Oh, we've spent years trying to get away from special pleading for tourism. One of the points in this book is to treat tourism through the same lenses that economists and input output put modelers and you know, everything else deals with other sectors. But there is one way it is different, and that is that the customer flies to the destination and they do see the people who are changing the sheets and in the way you don't see the people who are sewing the footballs. So that is a real advantage for us in this as part of the business case. It does affect performance, standards, delivery, repeat visits. And thirdly, the uh, reputational risk element that John's already flagged, I think that's where pathway three, the dynamic effects, will come back to being even more important because it is those issues such as on the effect on the water supply or on health in the area that people will really campaign about. They're less likely to campaign about the intersectoral linkages and the links with the farmers or the construction workers because they might be distant from the destination, which in a way is a shame because they might be very big from a property impact point of view. But the dynamic effects get very important in dealing with the business case. Okay, thank you. John? Uh, yeah, I, well, I'd have said the uh, same as, as Caroline on several of those issues. But uh, there was, I think, in the 1930s, uh, a mafia linked bank robber was uh, finally sprung and as he's being taken to prison a journalist said to him uh, why do you rob banks and he said because that's where the money is and I think that we're we're using quite a lot of the same logic in looking at mainstream tourism the point is that a tiny incremental change in mainstream tourism will have a much bigger impact than a huge change in niche tourism. That's why we look at the mainstream sector. Um, we've also based our, our ideas on looking at lots of niche tourism uh, to, to get some more innovative uh, solutions. But that, that's why we got to do it. And I think that I, I take the point about corporate social responsibility and Gambia is good, but I think that in, a, in the context where the demand from tourists themselves, us, uh, we're not beating the door down in terms of wanting this. That's, that's the harsh reality. I think everyone on the panel here would love it if, if that were the case. But it isn't a demand pull at the moment. In fact, it's probably more a supply push where people are making uh, uh, investments and thinking things that probably cannot be justified on a pure commercial criteria at the moment. Um, so the, the question is, I think, how to change opinion and, de and create that, that demand pool. So I think that we do need a, a strong commercial basis for this. And the strongest commercial basis will be if the public demand it in much greater numbers than they are at the moment. And that's, that's why I think there is a rather odd coalition of interest between you know, nerds like us, the industry, and probably tourism concern as well. Because on this issue, I think that there's a, a great commonality of interest. OK, thanks. John. Um, I agree with all of that. Um, I think there's some linkages there, though. The leadership point that Caroline made is, I think, a very, very important one. I think we can help the industry leadership through a process of, of education, this, this sort of poverty of knowledge thing that I started with. I think if we can help them to understand this better and, and design uh, development and interventions better, then they will see more success in it. They will grow in confidence. They'll be able to report it better and see better results in their reporting from a CSR perspective. 
And I think that becomes a self-fulfilling um, thing that I, we shouldn't underestimate the importance of, particularly with the largest players in the sector who have more and more onerous CSR reporting responsibilities there. We have two major FTSE 100 groups in the UK outbound industry. We have a number of FTSE 250s. It's not going to go away for them. So we can, we can help the cause by helping them to do this better, better interventions, better results, that gives them better reporting. So I think for me, particularly you know, thinking of our role as a trade association, I think that's a sort of enabling intervention, um, working with ODI, ODI and others that I think can really make a difference. Very good. A few questions to finish with and a, a couple, quick discussion on, on the public policy implications of this. And just to report that we've had a number of contributions from people watching on the web. Um, how can this become the main issue in cooperation agendas, government intervention and private sector participation? Uh, that's from uh, Malu Rendon, working in South America. Uh, why are many organisations currently reconsidering supporting tourism projects? That's from Frederick Thomas, who's a tourism economist. Um, in my research in uh, Mpupalanga province, South Africa, I found inefficiencies in coordination among different levels of tourism authorities. Uh, so what can, what can be done about that? That's from Daniel Levian. And uh, what kind of public-private initiatives uh, and, and how far can we go up this, 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 this bar chart of yours? That's from Frederick Thomas again. Mm. So anybody else want to come in on public policy implications? Um, other than those of you who say don't do it at all or uh, perhaps not don't do it at all but do it very carefully. What would you like to see from DFID, for example? <laughs> yes, please. <laughs> One or two on that. Thanks. Richard Judney, Deputy Director for South Asia. Uh, in DFID, I should declare an interest. I'm Caroline Ashley's partner, so I've been along for the ride and part of the journey that they were outlining uh, earlier. I also had a little bit of a role about 10 years ago in the kind of pro-poor tourism and tourism challenge fund era. It's nice to see Patricia uh, and Oliver. Again, I was going to ask the, the question back to the panel. I don't, am I the only person from DFID here? Am I as lonely as John is on the mass... Um, Mass tourism market looks like it. Um, should donors be doing more in this area? John, you mentioned trying to get more than 20 or 30 days work out of people. Um, name names if you want to. Is DFID less engaged in this um, than it ought to be? Caroline, you said we shouldn't treat tourism as a sector. I mean, is DFID doing enough on its work around promoting growth, getting the investment climate right, dealing with corruption, and public financial management? Are we doing enough? Do we not need to focus explicitly um, uh, on tourism as, uh, as a sector. Um, what can we learn um, from other donors in supporting governments to get greater bang for the buck? Uh, and finally, if I may, uh, can I take a little bit of exception, Simon, to what you said about tourism in Gambia? Um, uh, putting aside uh, for a, a moment the cultural uh, uh, implications of that kind of tourism, if, if we're getting uh, a lot more people through it, um, the fact that we're only getting 15 or 20 percent of benefits to, to local people is an issue. We should try and expand it. But a lot of other, a lot of those bars were niche bars you were showing on that second slide. Mm -hmm. If we can, you know, should we be focusing more on these kind of segments, um, trying to do away with the external damages, but uh, and ramp up the benefit where we where we can? Very good. I mean, I tell you that. All the time I was director of ODI, we used to, I felt we were banging our heads against a brick wall with DFID in trying to get interest in tourism, actually. Uh, but um, the others no wish to comment. Uh, the front, please, Liam. Thank you. My name is Juan. Uh, I think that's one of the challenges that I found. Uh, my name is Juan. I come from Mozambique. <clears throat> we do have also those kinds of projects with SNV and so on. In Mozambique. What's happening really is when you speak about uh, tourism, sometimes people <coughs> uh, think that, okay, now we are getting problem. Why? Because those destinations became expensive. Even when you go there with those percentages, 35%, they say, okay, I will get 30% uh, of balance, but the cost of living in this area will mean 80%, which means that sometimes they question those things. When you talk in terms of <coughs> uh, police, uh, I didn't read the book, 
maybe the colleagues from the financing sector could understand better if you put here figures. Because the, <coughs> I was always in a position to try to convince the financing colleagues to give me more money to promote Mozambique as marketing uh, people. The question, what does it mean, that percent of 10,000 pounds? Yeah, it's always a question. <coughs> Isn't 5% uh, of Cambodia more than the 30% 30, 30, uh, of Tanzania? You get always those questions. Maybe one of the other points which is interesting is that you found uh, donors, uh, governments, say no, tourism is a busy sector. But we realize that if <coughs> World Bank, IMF, IFC, all those donors, defeat also, if you consider tourism as a social sector, so, uh, support it as you support education, health, uh, probably it will help more to justify the proper tourism, even the uh, fair trade tourism. Otherwise, we'll have more time spending than reaching the point. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sorry for me. No, that was very good. Uh, I'm going to go along the, the panel from one end to the other. Um, and th these will be your last comments. So, John, a quick thought on public policy issues. Um, Hmm. Joined up government is an enormous problem, I think, in every aspect of tourism I've ever dealt with. So the outbound industry does not have a sponsoring, official or unofficial sponsoring government department. So that straight away tells you something. Um, we've had a chequered history, I think, in this area of engagement with the Foreign Office when there's a sustainable development unit, if it others. Um, so there's a huge problem there that we could do better, there's no doubt about that. Um, important, yes, but I think you've got to do that, but it's you've got to change industry. You've got, got to find a different way of engaging with mainstream industry because it's industry that's going to leverage to change ultimately. Thanks, Jonathan. Um, yeah, I think uh, I'd, I'd agree. I think that tourism is spectacularly unsuccessful at uh, getting its pound of flesh out of government. I find it stunning when you have these large enterprises that in many of the places we're working are, are one of the, the few parts of the economy that is actually globally competitive and is working and can't even get into the, the corridors of power at all. So, yes, I think government should make it easier in, in many of these places to do that. Uh, I'm, I'm continually struck by how uh, tourist enterprises often um, uh, punch below their weight. Uh, in terms of donor issues, I, I'd say that uh, DFID's not one of the most tourism-friendly donors, but I think the... Well, what I've noticed, actually, with time is that if you don't call it tourism, you call it uh, global competitiveness in the service sector or local economic development or enterprise development, uh, there's, there's normally a way for, for that to be overcome. Um, and I, I actually disagree that tourism's a social sector. I think that um, I think it's a private sector enterprise, but... The point is that if you if you accept that, um, the it doesn't then follow that the state either leaves just walks away from it um, or or um, tries to nationalise it. I mean, I, I don't think either of those models is is very sensible, and I think it, it's I think it is a very difficult um, balance to strike how the state should support the tourist sector. Um, without either abandoning it or, or seeking to take it over, which it does in many countries. Okay, Caroline. I think I said we wanted to move away from the idea that tourism is special and different because we get enough of that. But at the same time, we do have to recognise tourism provokes a knee-jerk reaction amongst people who focus on poverty and development. That, oh, it's a white, fat, old colonialism sitting around a sunbed. The question t John often asks, can you reduce poverty from a sunbed? It does provoke that knee-jerk reaction. 
And to be honest, I think we've seen more of that from DFID since 2005. We had a lot of support from DFID up to 2005 and the early days and in PPT pilots, not just in DFID, in the development world. And that's why this kind of research, I think, is needed to say, don't base it on a knee-jerk or an assumption, but let's look at the actual evidence. And that fundamentally is what we are trying to do. Other people have responded to the problem you've had. And Gideon, Sh Gideon Shilongo, who was the um, CEO of the Namibian Tourism Board, really found the same problem. He would go and argue the case and wouldn't get there. The solution that many people have done is to invest in tourism satellite accounts, which we are fairly critical of in here. We see it was a in very intensive use of resources, but they do serve the purpose. You can go to your Minister of Finance and show two pages and say, look, it's 9.6% you know, of our GDP if you include absolutely everything related to tourism. And Gideon told me, it's amazing. It works. After all that effort we put into the community stuff and this and that, Minister of Finance liked it. I think that's quite an expensive way to make the case, and I wish there were other ways. One last point, two last points. Um, sometimes we are finding the evidence for things that we already knew worked. And destination partnerships are something that we have argued for for many, many years, and Harold Goodwin was doing in the Gambia before I even got into this. This question from Mpumalanga. Really, partnerships on the ground with the private sector works with government to make these linkages work. We've often argued for, and I think the evidence does show more and more, that's what you need to make the linkages work. Last night, John and I, this is the last point, wrote a blog on business fights poverty, which was targeted at the business audience, four Ps, um, pay, procurement, persuasion of your tourists, and the fourth one, third one was partnership with governments. That blog, by the way, gets a free copy of the book for the best comment made in response to it. So if you're not wanting to shell out 18 pounds, go and put a comment on business fights poverty, and the people who are watching this and are here will be best positioned to make an informed comment. Oh, very good. Thank you very much. It isn't straightforward, is it, tourism? And I think the points that have been raised about the dislocations, about the environmental effects, about the water pressures in Zanzibar are not uh, trivial points, and they do need to be taken very seriously. But on the other hand, the point that Caroline just made, which is that we've, we've grown up with such a hostile attitude so often to tourism, and there hasn't been the underpinning to make the counter case, and we now begin to see that we do have the underpinning for a counter case. And as you say in the book, this or what? I mean, what's, what's the counterfactual? And the counterfactual might be something which has much bigger environmental impacts and much bigger dislocations. And clearly there are potentially very large benefits to poor people from this. So I think that we've made, uh, we've had a very good discussion tonight, a very serious and substantive discussion. I'm grateful to everybody. But I also think through this book, we've made real progress thanks to your work in shaping this whole debate and taking it forward. A very good friend and close colleague of mine, Emmanuel Decat, wrote a book in 1979, I see referenced here, mm. called Tourism Passport to Development. And in a way, here we are 30 years later, actually coming to very many of the similar conclusions, but with much stronger evidence, a much stronger case, and a much stronger platform for engagement both within the industry and public policy. So good job. Buy the book. There should be a drink in the kitchen. Uh, please uh, thank you all for coming. Join me in thanking the panel.